Hello, welcome to Psychology, and today we're going to be discussing schizophrenia. So, defined in the DSM, ment schizophrenia is a mental disorder that lasts for at least six months and includes at least two of the following symptoms. Delusions, which is when you believe something that's just not true hallucinations where you see or hear things disorganized speech which is when words are being used but they don't seem to have any connection to one another disorganized behavior again people doing things that don't make any sense and decreased emotional expression and oftentimes somebody with schizophrenia may seem like they are acting like a zombie because they don't seem to have conscious thought or they're just staring off into the distance. One of the things that we're going to be looking at is the neurobiology of the brain when you have schizophrenia versus someone who doesn't and you'll see a picture lower right here that shows that the schizophrenic brain has much more um, patches of this uh, space that's not getting the electrical currents. So there's three subcategories of schizophrenia. The first one is paranoid schizophrenia. It is characterized by auditory hallucinations, delusions that you're being persecuted by someone or a group. Oftentimes you'll hear people with paranoid schizophrenia discussing how the CIA are out to get them, or the NSA are out to get them, or the aliens are out to get them. And they also have delusions of grandeur or greatness, believing that they have a special connection to God, or a special connection to Satan, or a special connection to a certain celebrity. The next kind is disorganized schizophrenia. And this is marked by bizarre ideas, often about one's body, for example, believing that your bones are melting, confused speech. And if you look at the comic on the right hand side, you'll see what I mean by confused speech. This guy is saying, I can't find the pickles. I need a knife to write my paper. The words are legitimate words, but in the way that they're strung together doesn't make any sense childish behavior, great emotional swings, and they often ex neglect their personal appearance and their hygiene to a magnificent impact. You know, the scent, um, people who literally are afraid to get in the shower or bathtub because it, they believe that something terrible will happen. So they may not have bathed in or even years. Then there is catatonic schizophrenia, which is characterized by periods of wild excitement or periods of rigid, prolonged immobility. Sometimes the person assumes the same frozen posture for hours on end. And again, what you see here on the right is an example of how someone is in a fairly awkward position, but they can hold it for hours. It's almost as if their body and their brain are no longer connecting with one another. So who gets schizophrenia? Well, approximately 1% of the population develops schizophrenia during their lifetime. About 2 million Americans suffer from the illness in any given year. It is more likely to appear in men, slightly more likely than women, and the disorder often appears earlier in men, sometimes in the late teens or early 20s, whereas in women, the onset occurs in the 20s to early 30s. So it's not something you generally see when the child is very, very young. But, you know, and, and to be honest, you know, most five-year-olds have an imaginary friend or have an imaginary monster that lives under their bed. That is more due to our Disney uh, fantasies that we experience when we see Monsters, Inc. Or, you know, the desire to have a sibling that is closer to us in age. It's not schizophrenia. 
So, can you recover from schizophrenia? Well, if you have what's called type 1 schizophrenia, which include having symptoms such as hallucinations and delusions, you have a distortion of normal function. However, and this is the important thing, you do not have any intellectual impairment and you have a good reaction to the medication. In this case, you can recover. Now, when we say recover, we're really talking about managing the illness over a long term. It doesn't go away completely, but much like a chronic illness like asthma or high blood pressure, it can be managed. Now, type 2 schizophrenia, which are the usual symptoms, plus disorders of thought, disorders of attention, so they have little interest in interacting with others, motor disorders, meaning that they may have uh, problems with their physical body, emotional or affective disorders where their emotions are very dulled, and they have intellectual impairment, meaning they have a developmental disability, um, intellectual developmental disability, and a very poor reaction to medication. These are folks that are not going to have a good chance to live a quote-unquote normal life. So as a consequence, these are the folks that oftentimes are institutionalized by the family because, you know, they are really unable to care for themselves. The families are not prepared or equipped to care for them and they need professional help. So what causes schizophrenia? Well, we're going to look at the biological causes first. First, there's a genetic predisposition or a set of genetic markers. And this refers to an identifiable gene or number of genes or a specific segment of a chromosome that is directly linked to some behavioral physiological or neurological trait or disease. So what basically they're saying here is there is some element that it is carried through the genetic material that our parents pass along to us. So if your parent has schizophrenia, there is a 10% chance for their offspring to have it. However, if an identical twin has schizophrenia, there is a 50% chance that their twin will have it. Meaning, you know, it's definitely part of the DNA. It is part of what the twins share in terms of their identical DNA. So, you know, we don't know what necessarily these genetic markers are yet, but we know that they play a large uh, function in this particular situation. Neurological causes, again, still talking about the brain. Um, scientists have seen that 80% of brains of schizophrenics show larger than normal ventricles. And what you'll see over here, where the on the right-hand side, a normal brain, you have lots and lots of white space, and then the enlarged ventricles kind of push that white space away. So you know what you also begin to see is that in the frontal lobe you have less activation meaning it's not as uh, the cylinders are not firing on all eight cylinders you know so this is a normal brain lots and lots of activity that's in the red and over here with someone with schizophrenia you don't see as much activity in the frontal lobe additionally the frontal and temporal lobes, and the temporal lobes are right over your ears, um, tend to be smaller in a schizophrenic than in somebody who does not have the disease. Also, scientists have discovered um, abnormalities in the thalamus and the amygdala that um, are different from people who a quote-unquote normal brain compared to a schizophrenic. Environmental causes include stressful events and how people cope with them, hostile parents, poor social relations, meaning that they do not generally have a good social life in terms of having friends and a support group. 
the death of a parent or a loved one, and career or personal problems that contribute to the development and onset of schizophrenia. Now, generally, you do not see somebody who doesn't have schizophrenia in their family become schizophrenic. However, if somebody has the ge genetic predisposition, add in these environmental issues, and what comes together is this idea that, you know, the genetics exist, but the environment lights the match. And essentially, this is called the diathesis stress theory. And it's that people have the genetic predisposition, add to that the life stressors, and you have the onset of schizophrenia. Another major um, correlation that's been identified by researchers show an association between smoking marijuana and developing psychosis or schizophrenia later on. And basically, again, we're looking at the diathesis stress theory, where in an environmental cause, i.e. smoking a lot of marijuana when you're a young um, adult or a, someone in their teens, if it runs, if schizophrenia runs in your family, it is more likely to bring the onset on. So for example, if your parent has schizophrenia you have a 10% chance. Well, if you're also smoking a lot of marijuana, then the possibility is that it could bring on the disease sooner or it could bring on the disease when it would have just been dormant had you not been smoking that much weed. So how do they treat this situation? Well, the primary are neuroleptic drugs and these are also called antipsychotics and they're used to tra treat schizophrenia by changing the levels of neurotransmitters in the brain. There are two kinds of neuroleptic drugs that we're going to talk about. The first one are typical neuroleptics and these primarily reduce levels of the neurotransmitter dopamine and you know this medication was developed about 50 years ago and it dulls the person's brain activity so that they are pretty much easy to manage and they seem to have better thought process. The two big ones that you will often hear about are Thorazine and Haldol and um, you know there are benefits and negatives which we'll talk about in a minute. The dopamine theory, just to kind of add this, is the idea in schizophrenia is that it's somehow overactive and gives rise to the wide range of symptoms. So this idea that dopamine, an overabundance, can contribute to schizophrenia is one of the reasons that they use medications that manage dopamine. The other kind of neuroleptic, and this was a much more recent development, are called atypical neuroleptics or not typical neuroleptics. And you'll see medications like clozapine, risperdone, and they lower levels of dopamine and also reduce levels of other neurotransmitters, especially serotonin. So it's a much more comprehensive type of uh, scenario in terms of what medications or what neurotransmitters are being um, controlled. Now when we get into the side effects you're going to also understand why a lot of people who are schizophrenic do not like to stay on their medications. The first issue is a tardive dyskinesia and this involves the appearance of slow involuntary uncontrollable rhythmic moments and rapid twitching of the mouth and lips as well as un unusual movement of the limbs. It's basically like watching somebody um, chewing gum and they don't have gum in their mouth. They just can't control how much their, mo their mouth is 
moving and it can be something as minor or small as a compulsive need to lick their lips to their mouth opening their jaw constantly grinding there's a lot of issues and they're very obvious when people see it another side effect is dry mouth um, akathisia which is an unpleasant inner restlessness we often feel that at night when we can't sleep muscle stiffness cramping tremors and significant weight gain so you know these side effects were significant for people and a lot of times the schizophrenic will go off their meds because they see how much weight they're gaining they see how people look at them in the streets and unless they have a good social support system like their family oftentimes they would rather not have to deal with these side effects for an atypical neuroleptic it does get rid of a lot of the side effects that um, are very noticeable it has a very low rate of tardive dyskinesia but it can cause increased levels of glucose or blood sugar otherwise known as hyperglycemia which in turn can bring on or worsen a person's diabetes and ultimately they gain again excessive amounts of weight so when you see a lot of schizophrenics that are very heavy it's really not their fault because a lot of what's going on in their body is this slowing of the metabolism so that they're not burning calories um, the other issue that you often have is that people with schizophrenia have been cut off from society because of their odd behaviors and as such maybe their only friends they might actually have are the ones they have in their head and they prefer the delusions and the hallucinations to real life so when you are looking at somebody who has schizophrenia they oftentimes if not supported by their family will choose to stay off of their meds because at least they feel less alone so and on that chipper note that's the end of this presentation if you have any questions as always please feel free to text or email me have a lovely day